People sometimes ask me why a pastor would decide to run for the U.S. Senate. My answer is simple. I've always felt that my impact does not stop at the church door. That's actually where it starts. And I love this country and believe that what makes America so great is that we've always had a path to make it greater. I'm Raphael Warnock, and whether you congregate in a church, synagogue, or at kitchen tables across Georgia, we can all agree that Washington could use some moral leadership. That's why I approve this message. Welcome to The Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore. It is Thursday, December the 17th, 2020. On this edition of The Politocrat, a look at the police and how we have been socialized in American culture to view the police intrinsically as the good guy. Not that there aren't police who do their jobs well. Of course there are. But what I want to look at on this episode is the way that we here in the United States have been socialized, in fact, beyond the U.S., to view the police in only the most positive ways. That coming up next. Dear listener, let me read to you a story that I think definitely should be mentioned during this episode. This is from the Associated Press. The headline, video, colon, Deputy Runs Over Fleeing Black Man in Kansas Field by Roxana Hegeman. Bell Plain, Kansas is the dateline. The dash cam video captured a horrific scene. A Kansas sheriff's deputy in a patrol truck mowing down a black man who was running, shirtless, across a field in the summer darkness after fleeing a traffic stop. Lionel Womack, a 35-year-old former police detective from Kansas City, Kansas, alleges in an excessive force lawsuit filed Thursday that he sustained serious injuries when Kiowa County Sheriff's Deputy Jeremy Rodriguez intentionally drove over him during the August 15th encounter. Womack said in a statement that he hadn't been speeding, nor was he under the influence of anything when he was initially pulled over. His driver's license, insurance, and registration were up to date. Quote, when the first officer turned his lights on, I pulled over and complied, exactly as you're supposed to. But when three additional vehicles pulled up quickly and started to surround my car, I freaked out. That's when I took off. It was a fight or flight moment, and I was going to live, he said. I felt like I was in danger. This was out in the country, late at night, and it was dark. So I ran for my life. That's what you see in the dash cam video. I'm running in an open field and I'm scared. The graphic video is at the crux of the federal civil rights case filed by attorney Michael Kuckelman against a deputy in the U.S. District Court in Kansas. The lawsuit argues that Rodriguez used excessive force and was, quote, callously indifferent, end quote, to Womack's civil rights. Womack had left the police department earlier in August with hopes of growing his own security business. He was on his way back home from a business trip to California when a Kansas Highway Patrol officer in western Kansas initiated a chase over an alleged traffic violation, according to the lawsuit. Sheriff's deputies from Pratt County and Kiowa County joined in the chase. The car chase eventually ended on a dirt road, and Womack took off on foot across a nearby farm field. The dash cam footage from a Pratt County 
sheriff's deputy's vehicle shows Rodriguez using his patrol truck to catch up to Womack, who was unarmed. Rodriguez swerves his truck to hit Womack, knocking him to the ground and running over him. Womack rolls out from under the truck, his arms and legs flailing on the ground. As someone on the video shouts, lie down, lie down. A deputy in the second patrol truck can be heard uttering an expletive as he watches what is happening. Womack alleges in his lawsuit that he sustained serious injuries to his back, pelvis and thigh as well as to his right knee, ankle and foot. The dash, va- the dash cam video is disturbing, Kukelman said. It is impossible to watch a video of a deputy driving his truck over Mr. Womack without feeling sick. There was nowhere for Mr. Womack to grow to go. It was an open field and he was trapped, yet the deputy drove his truck over him anyway. Neither Keowa County Sheriff Chris Tedder nor his attorney has responded to Associated Press reports request to comment. No one has explained why Rodriguez chose to run Womack down. The deputy's race is unclear. Cuckleman urged Tedder in person and in letters to fire Rodriguez and the sheriff has refused. Rodriguez remains on patrol. Cuckleman also wants Rodriguez charged criminally and has accused the sheriff of engaging in a cover-up of the deputy's conduct. Four months later, Womack remains jailed on felony charges of attempting to elude a law enforcement officer by engaging in reckless driving and interference with a law enforcement officer. So... I'm breaking from the story here. So Womack is the guy, the brother, who got run over by this cop, the sheriff, whomever, cop. He's the guy that gets run over by the cop, Womack, and he is jailed on felony charges of attempting to elude a law enforcement officer. That's what they do all the time. Malcolm X talked about this and so have others. You're the one who is being beaten by the police and then they charge you with a crime. They're the ones committing the crime and they're charging you with what they're doing. Reckless driving and interference with a law enforcement officer? Well, you recklessly, it wasn't even reckless, you maliciously drove over this guy. Over his back and his front, I mean, and he's the one being charged with reckless driving? Don't get me started. Let me continue with the rest of the story. I'm almost to the end of it. I'm almost to the end of reading you something that you know is to be true. And you know it's true. I'm almost at the end of inconveniencing you. Inconveniencing your comfort. (laughs) Jeez. Court records show he is also charged with several... This This is Womack. This is the black man who was being chased down and run over. And this is what the records show he is also charged with. As I continue reading, several misdemeanor traffic citations, including failure to drive in the right lane in a four-lane highway, improper signal and driving without headlights. Wait a minute. The improper signal thing. How many people in the world do you know, including yourself, who have driven a car and not signaled when they've turned. Remember this happened to Sandra Bland. And she ended up dead. Some cop in Texas who had nothing to do. Some state trooper, racist, who had nothing better to do. Oh, she did. She turned and she didn't signal. Or she didn't signal at the appropriate time. It wasn't quick enough. It wasn't clear enough. So there, I'm going to now make her life a misery. 
And she's never going to see the light of day again. Give me a break. Womack comes from a law enforcement family. His wife and his mother are police officers with the Kansas City, Kansas Police Department. His stepfather retired from police work as a sergeant there. Two of his aunts are police dispatchers. Z Womack. Watch the video of her husband being run over for the first time on Wednesday. Replaying it four times as he struggled to understand why the deputy felt justified in using such force. Her husband is lucky to be alive, she said. Quote, I am a police officer as well, and I feel like, especially right now, it is a really difficult time to be a police officer. We don't always get the support, I guess, that would be helpful in this occupation. She said shortly after watching the video, quote, and this makes it a lot more difficult to be an officer, In quote. An officer who is capable of making decisions like that, she said, should not have a badge. Quote, to me, it showed a blatant disregard for human life, she said. Z. Womack filed a federal lawsuit last year alleging, quote, rampant racism and sexism, in quote, in the Kansas City, Kansas Police Department. Lionel Womack said in his statement that most police officers are good and that he believes in, quote, the Blue Brotherhood, in quote. But we have to hold law enforcement accountable when they cross the line, he said. These rogue law enforcement officers give a bad name to the good officers. And we have to stop them. I never imagined that I would someday be the victim of excessive force by a fellow law enforcement officer. He could have easily killed me. That was from the Associated Press dated today, Thursday, December the 17th, 2020. I will link that story to the line of notes of this episode. theme tune for the streets of San Francisco and of course I play it for very (laughs) selfish and sentimental reasons. That was the uh, 1970s television series that starred Carl Malden and Michael Douglas. That was one of my favorites. Really, really did enjoy that but that's not the reason entirely why I play it. There were so many others in the 1960s and 70s, these television shows that grew. I mean, in fact, even before that. Um, But I can think of so many of them here in the United States and and, in the UK as well. But I want to focus on the US, you know, Barnaby Jones and Beretta and, you know, you know, you know, uh, Barney Fife, you know, the, the Barney Fife character, I believe in the, 
in the Andy Griffith show, in the Andy Griffith uh, uh, program, and I forget the name of that, you know. But anyway, that might have been the name of it. But anyway, um, so it was before the 70s, though. But I, I concentrate in the 60s and 70s where all of these television programs really grew. Dragnet in the 60s, Joe Friday, you know. And all these shows about the police, Dragnet, you know, The Streets of San Francisco, Barnaby Jones, Beretta, Columbo, Kojak, Hawaii Five O, and then later ones like uh, Chips, you know, the California Highway Patrol and Miami Vice in the eighties and and that kind of thing. So in a Magnum, T.J. Hooker, I think, came around in the 90s, late 80s, early 90s. So we go from, say, the 60s. I mean, there were some before in the 1950s, but we go from the 60s through up into the 90s and through that 30, 40-year period, and if not more, before that in the 50s. There's this continuous television programming about the police, We see this in the movies as well. I mean, if we go back, um, you know, in the 19, I think 1960s and 70s, the Pink Panther series. Now, that was more, um, you know, Inspector Clouseau walking around, you know, Peter Sellers. I think the Pink Panther series started in the 60s. Late 60s it was, if I remember it correctly. And... Either bumbling, stumbling, inspector, just like Columbo was in a way. I wouldn't say he was bumbling, but he was somebody who was worn and weathered and kind of rumpled character, making him this ordinary person. But yet this guy was no fool. And you look back at these movies and then you go to the, you know, the Lethal Weapon movies and then the, you know, before that, the actually before that, the Dirty Harry movies of the 1970s with Clint Eastwood, Make My Day. And all of this to me is a complete socialization of the general public, whether in America or anywhere else, toward the so-called goodness and um, pro-police Now, again, I do want to say that there are police who do their job. And I know that because I've been someone who actually, on the occasions when I have not been stopped by police, I'm someone who has been, can say that I have had a few occasions where police have been actually decent to me. You know, they've actually treated me with respect. And just genuinely were dedicated toward doing their job. I, I, I've i told this story here before. Just last month, I called the police for the first time in my life. And it was in the middle of the night, you know. And it turned out to be... <laughs> this, is, this is kind of funny, but it wasn't at the time. Um, I'm going to just get to the shortcut of this. It turned out to be three raccoons. That's what it was. Three raccoons were making all this noise. And I thought it was some folks who really wanted to, you know, break in, (laughs) you know, it's just and I wasn't going to wait to find out. I wasn't going to wait. So I and the six cops, San Francisco PD, speaking of streets of San Francisco, six, not one, but six. Five men, one woman. The woman was the lead uh, officer. She was white. There were two white guys, two black guys, and I think one or two Latinx. I, I don't remember. It was in the. It was really late in the middle of the night, uh, and so this is the thing. And uh, and I'm thinking. Why did I call them? You know, almost instantly after I called them, I I thought, because there's so many of us in this country, here in the U.S., so many black people who, when they called the police, they know that they, you know, they're not going to ever be able to call the police or anyone again because they're 
ending, they end up being killed by the police. How many times have you come across a headline? How many videos have you seen? How many people who were widowers or widows have you seen give interviews? And how many non-indicted killer cops later have you seen giving interviews to 2020 and ABC about how nice they are as people? Oh, we're, I'm a nice guy, Darren Wilson, Ferguson. Michael Brown will never, ever be able to say that again because he's dead. But my whole thing is, that was my instant reaction. It's like, why did I call? Why did I call him? As I said, you know, luckily for me, very fortunately, there were some really, they were actually very nice, smiley faced police who actually treated me with respect. So I was relieved by that. I'm relieved that I, and I'm still able to talk to you. Well, first of all, I'm relieved I'm, I'm still alive is the point. But yeah, that I'm able to speak because there's lots of people who don't have that luxury, who don't have that because they end up dead. Some of them are pregnant women. Some of them are just People just minding their own business. A Tatiana Jefferson's no longer with us. You know? I mean, I can go down the list. There's so many people. Breonna Taylor's no longer with us. George Floyd, Rayshard Brooks. Those are just a small, I mean, that's just a small number of people. Jacob Blake is still here, but my goodness me. For the rest of his life, he's going to be unable to walk without assistance. He's paralyzed from his, I think, his his chest down. And what's happening to that cop that did that to him? Shot him seven, eight times in the back at close range. So my whole, my, the whole reason why I'm talking about this is because we've really been socialized in many ways to view the police as these, oh, friendly neighborhood people. And indeed, there may be some who are. I'm not saying that that isn't true, although I know a lot of people who would absolutely say, Omar, you're crazy. There's no such thing as a good police officer. I'm simply saying to you that we have been socialized in this country, particularly the United States, to view the police as the inherent good guy or good gal, if you will. And these TV shows have gone a long way toward indoctrinating us in that fashion, in that manner, in that way. I loved the streets of San Francisco in the mid 1970s, I think, or early. I would watch. I loved. I loved the streets of San Francisco. Big fan of it. It My it was my favorite show on television back then. Yeah, I'm old enough to actually remember watching it when it was being broadcast for the first time. I'm not talking rerun central here. I actually did watch that in the 70s. And I I, I was a big fan of, of Michael Douglas, still am to a degree. Um, his career and a lot of other things off the field, if it were, if as you were, if it were, you know, as it were, um, are well documented. I, I'm simply talking about, as an actor, I really was, am a big fan of Michael Douglas. And so... Streets of San Francisco was one of the earliest times that I got to see Michael Douglas. I think that was his TV debut. Um, of course, just a few years before, or at the time that the Streets of San Francisco was making its presence felt and debuting on American TV and UK TV, um, Michael Douglas had just produced the film One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. He became the youngest, I think, the youngest 
Oscar winning producer of a movie. Um, he was only like something like 28 or 29 years old when the film One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest won those four Oscars or however many Oscars it was, including Best Picture. The 1973 film, I believe it was, um, which was, you know, based on the book by uh, Ken Kesey. I believe wrote the novel. Milos Forman directed the movie, as I remember it back then. And that was such a depressing movie. Oh, God. Very good movie. But my goodness gracious me, that is not a movie I would watch during this pandemic. I would not touch it. It's a it was well acted. Jack Nicholson and the other gentleman, the Native American gentleman who um, was so good in that, too. I He was truly excellent. It was such a great film. It really was but just so harrowing, harrowingly depressing. You had the, uh, I believe it was Louise Fletcher playing Nurse Ratched, if I ever remember correctly. I believe she was nominated for that. I know Jack Nicholson was nominated, and I think he won. Um, the gentleman, the Native American gentleman, I think he was nominated. I don't remember him winning the Oscar. But again, Michael Douglas produced that film, and at the time, that film just, was the talk of the country. It was a big, big deal. Dealing with, and I don't want to give away anything in the movie, but it's a really powerful film. Danny DeVito was in it most famously as well. Um, and of course, Michael Douglas would do work with Danny DeVito literally 10 plus years later with Romancing the Stone and The Jewel of the Nile and then later on in the 1980s, The War of the Roses, which I thought was a masterstroke. Um, movie, of course, it's madcap, satirical, but really, I think, brutal and uh, quite fervently honest, I think, in some ways, even though it, it may be caricatured in other ways. Danny DeVito directed Michael Douglas and Kathleen Turner, and, and they had a number of films together, Douglas and Turner. Um, but Michael Douglas made his name through the streets of San Francisco, and of course, the Oscars uh, winning, uh, winning Best Picture for the, the One Through of the Cuckoo's Nest. But the whole point is, is that Michael Douglas was in the streets of San Francisco, which was a series that would be on television. Quinn Martin produced it um, and produced so many others of these t kinds of television series and dramas. And, and the streets of San Francisco, I love the, the views of San Francisco were the best part of the of the whole thing. And the sun was always shining. I don't think I ever saw a, a an episode of that where the sun wasn't shining. <laughs> and then you come here and you live here and you realize, bloody hell, that's not true. You know, San, the sun does not always shine here in San Francisco. There's lots of fog and cloud and, you know, but the sun is shining as I record this. So, so. <laughs> but the point I'm trying to make here is that you had all these TV series principally began in the 50s, ro rose in the 60s. And then in the 70s in particular, you had this, you know, Hawaii Five O and all of them. And they all did the same exact thing. It was a very black and white reading. Very rarely was there any nuance about who were the good guys and who were the bad guys. And the police were always correct in every instance. And the bad guys were never right. There was never any gray area. There was never any anything. And I think that when you have 40, 50 years of that relentless programming going through your bloodstream, it's like a drug. You start to believe it, you internalize it, and your brain acclimatizes to it. And yeah, you know, Bookum Dono was your favorite phrase in the 1970s, wasn't it? You know, if you were a Hawaii Five O fan, you know, that was your thing. You look. Bookum Dono, you waited for the episode. You waited for that moment in the episode where Jack Lord told Steve McWilliams, I believe was the actor's name. Bookum Dono. That was like the biggest part of that whole whole thing. Everybody, at least I was, when I watched that in the set, I waited for Jack Lord to say to Steve McWilliams, Bookum Dono. I did. I mean, that that was the line of the every episode. But there was never a thought that these uh, TV police were corrupt or criminal or 
We we backed them. I remember backing them. Go get that bad guy. And that stuff is filtered on now. You know, there was that series Cops in the 80s and 90s, particularly in the 90s. That's when that series really took off. And it was these regular police on the street running after predominantly black folk and brown folk. And then you get every now and again, you get these... Um, You'll get white people kind of, whoa, you know, drug addled or whatever it is, uh, you know, whatever. And they'd be chased and it, the, the whole thing was still about the police being the force for good. Even when Rodney King was beaten on video, even when you had, you know, 18 LAPD. I mean, this is what was really crazy because as these TV series were running. The real narrative, the truth, the facts were showing that police corruption was running wild, always always had been, had been going on for decades. Police brutality against black folk in particular had been going on for decades in the 60s. I mean, this was, I mean, I think a lot of this was also uh, this counter-programming to what was actually happening. What about the Los Angeles Police Department? I just talked about Rodney King. LAPD beat him to within an inch of his life. And those cops did not get criminally convicted at all. And then you had the uprising in Los Angeles in 1992 and 93 as a response when Rodney King was beaten to within an inch of his life in March of 1991. We're coming up on 30 years, a 30-year commemoration of that coming up in March of 2021. Rodney King is no longer with us. He died uh, a few years back. But this was counter-programming. These these police shows, these TV shows, these movies, they were counter-programming. I mean, as you saw... What was going on on the streets of Los Angeles, all over the country, what you saw in the 1960s in the civil rights movement, you saw what happened on that bridge in Selma, Alabama, what happened to George uh, Floyd this year, but what happened to John Lewis? 65, 1965. And, And what happened to Amelia Boynton? A beaten... Beaten, I mean, beaten to a pulp on that bridge. There's the police doing this in Alabama. And even all the while they were running these TV shows with the police doing so well, you know, oh, you know, really good. And the police are great, you know, Barnaby Jones and, you know, and Ironsides and, you know, I mean, that was, the, I think that was all the 70s and then remember it. Barnaby Jones and Beretta and, you know, and good police. These are the police, you know, and it, and there was never a gray area and there was never a doubt when you watch those television series, who was good and who wasn't. Now, more recently, I mean, it's just incredible. And that's in the society where you're hearing about what these police are doing in Birmingham and all over the country to, to black people. Beating us to with it. I mean, murdering us. Or Jimmy Lee Jackson. What happened to Jimmy Lee Jackson in '65 or thereabouts in Alabama? Same area, same thing. Selma got shot to death by police. I mean, the, 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 and yet you still had as this counter programming these police shows, these dramas. You even had um, Angie Dickinson in the 1970s with Police Woman. So that, to a degree, tackled you know, some of the sexism, or in fact, it displayed the sexism as it was attempting, I guess, to tackle it or at least depict it. And, the, it, and you know, and they, that whole show, Police Woman, as it was called, starring Angie Dickinson, marketed, you know, the, 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 the sex appeal of Angie Dickinson in the role of Police Woman. So you look at the opening credits to Angie Dickinson, policewoman, she played policewoman, and you know you you see her legs, you see this, you see that, and da 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 da, and it's you know it's like well wait a minute are we focusing on her body or are we focusing on the job that she's doing as a as an officer <laughs> you know 
I mean, and you look at the credits, the open, and it was, you, you know, you see her brat, you know, you, you see her cleavage, you see her. I mean, it's like you're you're focusing more on her as an ob, as a sex object. You know, you're you're objectifying her more so than you are showing us the kind of work she's doing. It's anyway, and then you had you know you had all these series later. Um, then the cops got a little bit more. They had a little bit more personality to them. Magnum PI, you know. Then they added a more diverse cast. I think it was Roger Mosley as as TJ in the helicopter. Um, you know, and then you add it, it, but the the frame stayed the same. It was the white male cop, right? Generally speaking, that was the so called primacy of of the police. And it's the, and this is what's also interesting is that in the early nineteen seventies, you had these TV, TV series. When on the big screen, you had Shaft, who was a police officer, a brother, black man, who wasn't taking any BS. But yet, to me, he remained still very much an establishment type of figure versus the outlaw that the great, the one and only Melvin Van Peebles played in his seminal 1971 film Sweet Sweet Back's Badass Song. Now, he wasn't a cop, now, he, he killed cops in that movie. It was out of self-defense, as I remember watching that movie. And it was a movie that was X-rated. Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song was a film that... And I interviewed Melvin Van Peebles about this. Oh, gosh, must be 15 years ago now. I wish I could dig that interview up. It was really good. It was terrific. He's a San Francisco guy. He, you know, he worked on Muni, on San Francisco municipal uh, buses, and he, he was a cable car operator out here in San Francisco. So was Maya Angelou. Maya Angelou was once a San Francisco cable car operator. That's a true story. As was Melvin Van Peebles. In fact, in our conversation, he talked about that. This is a, this was a, and he's still alive, I shouldn't say was. This is a renaissance man. He he worked on the stock. He was a stock trader on the New York Stock Exchange. He he, he was a, uh, as I said, he operated uh, cable cars here in San Francisco, which still run, by the way. You know, he he he's written books. He's directed. He's, he's done so many things. Great film director. And he directed and starred in Sweet Sweet Back's Badass Song. He financed it himself. It was independent. He did the produce. He did everything on that film. He got it into theaters basically by himself. It was the it was the biggest grossing independent film at the time. The first X rated movie to do well. And I know there was Midnight Cowboy. I get it. Midnight Cowboy was two years before that in nineteen sixty nine. It won Oscars. I get it. That was the first X rated film to win Best Picture at the Oscars. So I'm not. Missing that out. But I'm talking about an independent movie that was done completely outside of Hollywood, which Midnight Cowboy was not done completely outside of Hollywood. It was not. Um, I believe Warner Brothers may, or Orion may have been the, the company that did it. But this was done entirely by Melvin Van Peebles. And so you had this counter, you had this counter, you know, and the the so called black exploitation era, I hate that word, um, provided somewhat of a counter, um, and but you had people like Coffee, Coffee, um, played by uh, oh goodness me, don't forget her name. You cannot forget her name, Pam Greer. Oh my God, I would have absolutely quit doing any more episodes of this <laughs> if I didn't remember her name, Pam Greer, the the great, wonderful one and only. Brilliant Pam Greer, who played Jackie Brown later on, by the way, in Quentin Tarantino's movie. But which has a great soundtrack, by the way. But the thing I'm talking about is, yes, there were these moments where you had a little bit of pushback. But a lot of these figures were were still essentially, quote unquote, establishment figures as police. 
And yes, there was a shaft, but he was still within the Harlem PD, the New York, you know, he was still within that mold. Then, you, you know, at the same time, again, in 1971, you had Dirty Harry, San Francisco, you know. That's Dirty Harry Callahan, Clint Eastwood. So you had all this stuff going on, especially in the 70s, where I think there was a battle and a wrestling for the consciousness and which kind of, quote unquote, authoritarian figure was going to win the day coming out of the very turbulent 1960s. It's coming out of a place where, you know, you had three different, well, you had many political assassinations in the 60s, my gosh, all over the globe. But coming out of a place where you had three or four of them, actually five of them that were really significant. Medgar Evers, Malcolm X, JFK, RFK, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., those are the five. I believe that's five that I just rattled off. And there were more, but those were the significant ones. Not that all the others weren't significant, but I mean, those are the ones where, boom, people sat up and paid attention. The two Kennedy brothers, Malcolm X, Dr. King, Medgar Evers. And if I've forgotten any US ones I'm talking about, then please let me know at the popcorn R E E L on Twitter. But there was a lot going on, but this image of the police being, you know, completely stenciled into your brain as these do gooders. When at the very same time, reality was telling us otherwise. The long history of corruption in the Los Angeles Police Department. Daryl Gates symbolized that as the police chief for God knows how many years. You had the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, for decades controlling that thing. He had tabs on seven presidents, for God's sake. You know, it was once said, or if, you know, I believe it was once said, I'll say it if it wasn't. It was once said, I believe, I think it was, that J. Edgar Hoover was the most powerful person in America. He was more powerful than the presidents. President Kennedy, President this, President that. The guy was at the FBI for for 50 years as the director of the FBI, whatever it was. This guy, I mean, this guy's been around for a long time. Long time. Leonardo DiCaprio, by the way, played him in uh, a uh, film called J. Edgar, which was directed by guess who? That's right. Clint Eastwood. God, it's a small world. And that's the same Clint Eastwood who, by the way, was talking to an empty chair in 2012. Do you remember that? How embarrassing and disgraceful that was? And how racist Clint Eastwood has become? Maybe he always was. Bobby Kennedy, for another quite different example, was 38. We wanted him to tell his brother, the president, to personally escort to school on that day or the day after a small black girl already scheduled to enter Deep South School. That way, we said, it will be clear that whoever spits on that child will be spitting on the nation. He didn't understand this either. It would be, he said, a meaningless moral gesture. We would like, said Lorraine, from you a moral commitment. He looked insulted, seemed to feel that he'd been wasting his time. Well, Lorraine sat still, watching all the while. She looked at Bobby Kennedy who perhaps for the first time looked at her. But I'm very worried, she said, about the state 
of the civilization which produced that photograph of the white cop standing on that Negro woman's neck in Birmingham. That was an excerpt from the documentary by Raoul Peck from 2016, I Am Not Your Negro. That's the part of the documentary that recalls the interaction that Lorraine Hansberry, James Baldwin, and others had with Robert F. Kennedy, who was then the Attorney General of the United States, around the issues of police brutality in the 1960s. And you heard there the narration of Samuel L. Jackson as James Baldwin. The last part of that narration about the white cop with his knee on the neck of a black woman in Birmingham, Alabama in the 1960s. There are photos of this and you can see the photos as well, I'm sure online, but you can also see them in the film I Am Not Your Negro, a must-see documentary that you should watch before the year 2020 is out. The real world of the police and what black people have to face with police versus that TV film fantasy world that you have been indoctrinated on all your life. It's time to step into the real world. was the opening theme for Hawaii Five O, the original Hawaii Five O from the nineteen seventies. Um, that that was a really great opening tune, one of my favorites. Look, uh, by the way, I got the name of the actor wrong. It was James MacArthur who played Dano or Danny. Um, book him Dano. That that is James MacArthur. That's the actor who played. Um, not Steve McWilliams. I don't know where I got that from. But I got the Mac part correct, <laughs> at least. But that was another series. I loved Hawaii Five-0. And really successful TV series. And that opening credit line, the opening credits are really good. I'm actually going to link to those. I'm going to link to both of those openings. So you can see them. Those Streets of San Francisco and Hawaii Five-0. Uh, both in the 1970s, terrific television series. But my whole thing is, the whole point of what I'm getting at is that we've been so heavily socialized to give the you know to give police this reverence. And it's not to say that police um, shouldn't be respected. They're trying to keep uh, people safe. Um, and I respect that they face those kinds of challenges, people who... Um, commit these, you know, all kinds of horrible crimes. I'm not talking about jumping a turnstile at it. And people are being killed for that. That's what just kills me, right? Uh, people are being killed jumping over a turnstile and a police officer goes and shoots someone dead, dead. But what I'm saying is, is that, yes, uh, being a police officer is a dangerous job, but being a black person is a dangerous existence in a racist country. To be walking around here 
and not realizing whether or not some cop is going to come up and roll up on you and pull out their gun, his or her gun, their gun, and and start, uh, I mean, I get it. I get it. You know, most police officers don't ever use their service weapon. Well, again, yeah, that's that is actually true. But that's really cold comfort to all of those black folk and, and some brown folk who get murdered by the police who do use their service weapon and do use their gun. I mean, you know, that that's what's going. We've had what, 300, 400 or more people killed by the police this year. It's probably a lot higher than that even. You know, I think one year it was over a thousand or way past. I mean, there, there's a website somewhere that tracks all of this. So to, it's just very interesting to me when you put the television narrative and the movie narrative out there and put the actual real life facts, the real life world that we're living in out there, the real world. And you'll find that it ain't the same as Hawaii Five O or the streets of San Francisco when they're chasing after some penny ante criminal, some, you know, penny ante crook. You know, it, it just ain't the same, you know. And that's the gulf. And I think a lot of people perhaps have been awoken from that slumber. And I think that what happened, the murder of George Floyd in this calendar year, the assassination of Breonna Taylor and the execution of, and by the way, George Floyd, that was an execution too. When that cop and those cops executed, that was an execution when they did that to George Floyd. Execution. It was something out of a snuff movie. And no, I don't watch snuff movies, but I know what they are. And what happened to Breonna Taylor was an execution, an assassination. Same thing with Rayshard Brooks. People seem to have forgotten Rayshard Brooks. And there are others that I don't even remember, but they're there. And what happened to Jacob Blake, an attempted assassination and murder, attempted murder. I mean, the, these things now, there's no way a person in this country, particularly a white person in America, there's no way they can ignore any of this now. There's no way. Because you have to become part of a movement. And that is what you're seeing more white people do, particularly younger white people. And you did have older, you know, white people in there, you know, beyond the age of 60, getting out there and, and getting involved. Um but I want to know where all that leads for them personally. Where, uh, are they going to continue? Are people who are white who, who do that, who are older? I'm not talking about the younger white folk because they, they get it. Many of them understand this is going to be a generation's long fight and it has already been. And so, yeah, you know, I mean, this is something that is going to go on. But I want to know... You know, the wall of mums. What happens to the wall of mums now? The ones who are in Portland and other places, they fu- they did that thing and they they got on TV and the, the person who founded them did. And what's happening with that now as we go into 2020 with Joe Biden, 2021 and Joe Biden being in the White House? What What's happening with that? You know, you know, Kamala Harris was a prosecutor, worked with the San Francisco police. She's going to be vice president. And she's vice president elect at the moment and president elect Joe Biden. They're both going to be in the White House in 34 days. What is the agenda? Again, I come back to that question. I've laid out the analysis and the contrast and how there are two different worlds here. The movie and TV world that glamorizes police and pumps them up and demonizes all the people that they run after, including black men and women, right? Contrast that with the real world of black men and women, black people who are living their lives and their lives are brutally ended by these police who assassinate them. And it's a segment of police that may be small, but the so-called good cops, they're not doing anything about any of this. So that's why people out here are saying that police are bad news 
And that's probably the nicest thing that they're saying. Short of ACAB. Yeah, I've, I know people who are police officers. You know. I've had friends who are police officers. I don't anymore. You know. But I, I did. At one point. So I, I mean look. These, these, are, these are the things. right? At the end of the day it comes down to. What kind of police do you want to see? Do you want to see the Beretta? Do you want to, no, the Beretta? Do you want to see Barnaby Jones and and Steve and uh, you know and um, Jack Lord? You know, book him Don. You know, do you want to see Dono out there? Do you want to sh- see Shaft? Or do you want you know who? Do you want to see uh, Cleopatra Jones? Coffee. Or do, you, do you, or do you want to see, you know, a cop that actually, you know, ain't glamorized? I don't know if Cleopatra Jones was a cop, by the way. That might be wrong. Oh, Lord. It's been such a long time since I've watched a lot of this stuff. Um, do you want to see the CHP? I mean, Chips? I mean, you know Chips. You know Chips. I love the music for that. Chips was in the 1980s. I love, I love the, uh, you know, I love that music. You know, I just, I do, I do. I mean, come on now. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, you can't help it. You can't help it. You know, if you're a certain age in particular, come on, Miami Vice would, would come up later. I mean, Chips, by the way, Eric Estrada and Larry Wilcox, um, they hated each other off set. <laughs> I mean, but that's not the point, though, whether they liked each other or not. Lots of people work together who can't stand each other. It, it happens on your job. I've experienced this. You've experienced this. Anybody listening to this has experienced working with someone that they cannot stand. And usually it's their boss. <laughs> usually it's the boss for so many reasons, right? Right. Or it could be that obnoxious person that sits in the cubicle. Well, no longer sits in the cubicle because, of course, um, you know, many people are out of work or not in offices or there's only one person in an office or people are at home in their office working from home. Uh, you know, Chips, Chips, you know, is like, you know, the, the, the those guys, I think well, Chips was in the 80s, I think. It might have been in the 70s as well. But I remember it being in the early 80s. It might have been in the 70s. But I am not sure that it was. But someone can correct me on that. So maybe it was the 70s. But anyway, Chips at California Highway Patrol. And when they have that opening, which I will also link to, they fo- there's a focus on the gun, the boots. I mean, it's kind of fascistic. It's kind of this, you know, there's boots and the gun and the, and the badge. And the shades. It's like and, and Hitchcock, by the way, I cannot do this episode without without saying this. Alfred Hitchcock was terrified of the police. Alfred Blumen Hitchcock. Absolutely afraid, scared to death of the police. And he made it clear in, in 
nearly all his movies, especially, especially Psycho, especially Psycho, when the moment when Marion Crane is driving through Arizona and she's stopping to get gas or whatever, and then there's a, or, or she gets stopped on the, uh, on the way th- through Arizona and this cop stops her. And he leans in and the first time you see him, he's got these big shades on this kind of, you know, white cop, white male shades. He's got this blank, robotic, chiseled look on his face. Very kind of uber fascist look, kind of this so-called master race, you know, Germanic look. And he's got this hat on and it's, Yes, uh, ma'am, may I get your uh, identification? You know, something like that. I forget the exact line. And the, he fills the screen when Hitchcock takes a shot of him with the camera. It, the, the, you watch, watch Psycho. It, it, you don't have to watch the whole thing. But there's a... I mean, it's a great movie, of course. We know it's a great movie. The shower scene, oh my goodness me. That's a, a really terrifying thing. Um... And there's a whole thing, uh, there's a whole documentary about the shower scene by itself. And there are uh, there are DVD iterations of Psycho that go into it as well and go into the whole making of the whole movie. But that's a whole other story. I'm talking about there's a shot in that movie when the police officer is on camera and his whole face, his eyes and his mouth and his face fill the entire screen. And it is, it's it's quite terrifying. And that was about Hitchcock's own fear of the police, which he was literally projecting onto the screen, onto the big screen as an image. It's really something. And, and so Psycho was 1960. And so it was just this push and pull between real life and movies and, you know, TV and all the, how all this was going. And again, you know, Eric Estrada and Larry Walcott couldn't stand each other uh, off screen. But they managed to make it work on screen. You know, all these TV series. And it was always, almost always white men, right, in this police officer role or detective role. There were not too many black women I remember seeing. I mean, yes, there were, you know, coffee, but that was more of a different kind of thing. But still, the point is, is that there weren't too many black detectives getting their own television shows. You had to wait till Luther, the BBC series, right? Luther, back in the early 2000s. And I still need to watch that. I've not watched it. Idris Elba, I apologize to you. You know, I think it's still on Netflix or one of these flicks, you know, online flicks, Amazon flicks, Hulu flicks. I mean, it's all the same, isn't it? (laughs) But I, you know, this is... uh, but you, you, that was the model. The, the 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 predicate was, it was usually almost always a white man, almost always a white man. And um, as I seem to remember, back in the day, um, very few white women. They were, I mean, the only white women I remember seeing back in the sixties were, you know, was it Leave It to Beaver with um, God, June. Cleaver? I forgot the actor who played her. But um, anyway, I, I, I seem to be drifting far afield here. But the point is, is that that was the model. It was always this white male uh, person, you know, white male who was, uh, you know, I don't know. It was just, it was pretty darn, anyway, I don't know. And I, you know, it, it, it's, it's. The, the, it was the same thing, you know, Ironside was, you know, in the 60s and 70s, uh, and I love that theme from Clint, Quincy Jones, it was just the best, it was one of the best, you know, but anyway...
Now, guess which theme tune that was. Guess which one. Guess which one it was. Oh, all right. I'll tell you. It's Police Woman. That is the theme for Police Woman, Angie Dickinson, uh, back in the 70s. Uh, I remember that so well. Oh, man. And, 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 and I'll link to that one, too. I, <laughs> I'll link you to all these all these series because I want people who aren't of a who are not of a certain age to really see um, how these things played out these themes um, who you saw in these opening credits and who you did not see in the opening credits of these series how sexist they were particularly in the case of police woman I, as I told you earlier the I remember you see the clear you, this is how Andrew this is now the the series is called Police Woman, and An, Angie Dickinson, Angie, Angie. I can't I can't do it the way Mick Jagger does, right? Angie, the, which is a really great song, by the way. The Rolling Stones, go listen to that. Um, I remember that one way back when too. It was you know Angie? <laughs> God, I am so butchering. The uh, actually destroying that that song. <laughs> I have to pick my spots with these. Um, <laughs> I have to pick my spots with these. Uh, <laughs> these renditions. The these uh, <laughs> these. <laughs> oh dearie me! I have to pick my spots with these uh, American Idol moments. Uh, these 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 uh, moments of. Uh, Oh, dear, oh, dear. Anyway, trying to sing. So desperately trying to sing (laughs) to get a... Oh, dear. Anyway, but Angie Dickinson was introduced. The first thing you see... Well, anyway, you you have to watch the opening credit sequence. And I will say this as a spoiler alert. You see more of her breasts and her legs than you do of her face. Pretty much. It's a cl- it's a it might be a tie for the amount of screen time. You should literally index it and count how many seconds you see Angie Angie Dickinson's face and how many seconds you, the cam that you see the camera showing her breasts or her legs. I kid you I kid you not. I am I, why would I sit here and make that up? I've included the link to this episode to the YouTube video. You you judge for yourself. It's pretty damn blatant. I mean, this stuff, this sexism. Phew, man, wow! If you if you think it's bad today, Lord have mercy. Back in the sixties and seventies, and before that, of course, but particularly those to those two decades, and you can even go for you can go back to the eighties. I mean, anyway, I can go on. I'm one of these days. I'm going to go into some of that as well. But but I'm doing it here. Uh, Angie Dickinson, you know, was. Uh, I mean, she was in the film too at the time around the time called uh, Big Bad Mama. She played Big Bad Mama, right? It was this whole again this ex- this B movie or exploitation series. Um. And she it was around. I think that was around the time of, if I remember, it was around the time of uh, Police Woman. And I, I kid you not, watch the opening. I put a link in the episode. Watch the opening to the theme of that TV series, and you tell me what you see more of: her face, or her breasts, or her legs. You tell me. You tell me. I guarantee you her face will not be the answer to the to my question. What do you see more of? It's like a Jeopardy question, right? I mean the the late great Alex Trebek could have could have asked it. He never did. What do you see more of in the opening theme to Police Woman? Actually, that's not how Jeopardy works. <laughs> it would be the Daily Double would be... Oh, the Daily Double. Oh, Jesus. The Daily Double would be breast, legs, or face. And then the answer would be... Well, the question would be... 
No, 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 no. Let me start that again. The, the, the Jeopardy answer would be, for the Daily Double, would be breasts. And the answer would be, the thing you see most of Angie Dickinson in the opening credits of Police Woman. I'm, I kid you not. That is exactly how it was in the 1970s. It was so horrible. And even before that, it was just... Uh, and it's still pretty damn bad. It's not like that's really changed a lot, has it? But again, how we are lensed to view the police through popular culture, through the media, through television, through the movies... definitely has an effect, don't you think, on how a lot of us view the police in reality, in real life? You've got family members, perhaps, who are police officers, so you probably, if you're in that position, you have a particular bias one way. And certainly, if you've been treated very horribly by police, you've been shot, you know someone who's been killed by the police, you obviously have a very different view of them. That's not even bias, it's just the reality. So which view do you have of the police? Do you have the streets of San Francisco view of the police? Or the Dirty Harry view of the police? Or the uh, other San Francisco denizen, you know, Bullet, played by Steve McQueen, 1966 or thereabouts, on the big screen. Do you have do you have that view of the police, or you know the the super cool Steve McQueen type? Do you have the the view of the police with Shaft? This this private dick is a bad mother. Shut your. Do you, is that your view of the police? Is that your view? Or is it the LAPD? In 1971, in 68, Sam Yorty and Malcolm X saying, you know, Sam Yorty is a, he's the mayor. I think he was the mayor. He wasn't the police. He was the mayor of Los Angeles. He might have been a police chief as well. I don't know. Sam Yorty, Los Angeles. And I remember Malcolm X read him the riot act as he should have. You know how many black folk that the LAPD were killing in the 1960s? Malcolm X once held this demonstration uh, out there against against it was one of the nation that got murdered, nation of Islam. Brothers, I believe. So you know that this 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 is uh, you know you, you what is your view of the police? I guess that's really my central question. Um, after all of this, is are you is your view wedded to the police as the TV series informed? Or indoctrinated, and the films and the lethal weapon is—is is your view of the police Mel Gibson and Danny Glover? It certainly ain't Mel Gibson, who once called a female, I think, white female police officer, some really nasty things, and also accused her of being—I mean, I don't even want to repeat the stuff. You know, Mel Gibson—that's a whole nother story. You know, but is that your view of the police? Or, you know, is your view Ironsides? Is your is your view um, Jack Lord and, and James McArthur and Bookham Dunno? You know, what's your view of the police? Is it, you know, what is your view of the police? Is it the Sweeney in the UK? The professionals in the UK? And I'm not going to even try doing re- repeating the theme for that because that would be embarrassing and better off playing it. But what is your view of the police? Is it Kojak and Who Loves Your Baby? It, with a lollipop? Is that is that is that your view of the police? Or is your view of the police like you know, is your view of the police what you see outside your window? And even beyond the local news, on videos, on Twitter, in your interaction with them. Yes, of course, there are some police officers who never, ever have to fire their weapon and who don't kill people and who actually are decent. But 
They're not decent if they sit quietly while their partners are discharging their weapons and are killing people, shooting them in the back, planting stuff on them. The silent ones, the ones who sit there and don't say anything, don't prevent these things from happening, they are just as bad as the ones who do shoot their gun into Jacob Blake's back seven times, eight times, who do bust into Breonna Taylor's home and shoot her God knows how many times as she's in her bed, who do sit there for nine and a half minutes on the neck of George Floyd while the video is rolling on top of that and just looking into the camera like he's posing for it. Where do you stand? Thank you very much for listening to this edition of The Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore.